This episode is sponsored by Mocha Master. Mocha Master brewers are designed to give you the true flavor of the coffee that the roaster and grower intended, consistently brewing 40 ounces of coffee in four to six minutes at the optimal temperature. Perfect coffee is a science and an art, and Mocha Master coffee brewers make it easy to brew the perfect cup every time. Head the link in the video description for your chance to win one of 10 Babish branded Mocha Masters. Now let's get down to basics. All right, so traditional tiramisu, apart from coffee, is mostly whipping air into egg whites and egg yolks separately, repeatedly, and deliciously, all the while taking every possible precaution to prevent knocking that air out of the eggs. First up, the ladyfinger cookies, for which we're gonna separate six eggs, first beating the yolks together with 60 grams of sugar and one teaspoon of vanilla extract at high speed until it reaches the ribbon stage, at which point you can drizzle a full figure of eight into the batter before it loses shape. Scrape this out and set it aside in a large bowl and then clean the bowl completely. As even the slightest suggestion of egg yolk can ruin your egg white meringue, which is what we're making next. First, beating those remaining egg whites until they're nice and frothy, about 30 seconds on high speed, and then slowly streaming in 120 grams of granulated sugar while the mixer runs. All these little teeny tiny grains of sugar are what's gonna puff air into the egg whites, transforming them into a light, shiny, creamy, sticky substance that we know is done as soon as it hits Stiff Peaks and not a moment later. Stiff Peaks is exactly what it sounds like, a drip of meringue standing up straight of its own recognizance, while overbeaten eggs are more frothy, kind of like bath bubbles. Now we're doing what's known as the sacrifice method, adding a third of our beaten egg whites to the egg yolks, gently folding together until combined but still streaky. Then we're adding the remainder of the egg whites and even more gently folding together until, again, just streaky. Last but not least, we're sifting in 170 grams of cake flour and a half teaspoon of kosher salt, folding that into the mixture even more gently than previously thought possible, trying your very darndest not to knock any more air out of the eggs, and checking the bottom of the bowl for any pockets of as-yet undiscovered flour. Once it is just combined, it is ready to pipe into lady fingers. For that, we're transferring to a piping bag with a wide, round tip, Line a rim baking sheet with parchment paper secured in place with nonstick spray and commence to piping. Now, this is just enough batter to fill a half sheet like this one. Unfortunately, I was being a little bit of a show off and made these big old honking lady fingers and ran out of dough before I could finish up the tray. Now, what you're seeing is a pivotal moment in the home cook's mind. Should I scrape it out and repipe it? Is that gonna ruin it? Nah, probably not, let's do it. And so begins a valuable lesson in not overworking your batter, because after repiping, not only can you see that it's lost a lot of its volume, but it completely collapsed in the oven. Lady fingers don't puff up much in the oven, but to see them actually puff down is humbling. So let's do it all again, this time trying our darndest to pipe down all the batter evenly. And since my straight lines weren't straight nor lines at all, I decided to pipe them into whatever this continuous diagonal pattern is called. But since this is ending up as layers in a cake, you can pipe it however you want. You can even spread it out flat. Before we're baking, we're dusting the fingers down with a freshly fallen snow's worth of powdered sugar. Then these are headed into a 375 degree Fahrenheit oven, preferably with convection, for about 10 to 12 minutes until it's set, lightly browned, and the edges are starting to pull away from the sides of the pan. While this cools to a state of complete coolness, we can make the mascarpone cream, for which we're repeating the exact same process with the eggs and egg whites, this time with five eggs, 50 grams of sugar going into the yolks, and 25 going into the whites. Also, this time I whip the egg whites first because egg whites don't deflate egg yolks the same way the other does to the um, other way around there. In other words, you don't need to wash your bowl between beatens. Now, before we combine the two, we have to first gently fold the egg yolks together with 450 grams of room temperature mascarpone cheese. We're doing the same sacrifice method here, adding a third of the egg yolks and folding gently to combine before adding the remainder. Once all the egg yolks and mascarpone are combined, but still streaky, then doing the same with the egg whites. Add a third, gently fold, add the rest, gently fold, taking all the care in the world not to knock all that air out of the eggs. Now, the more eagle-eyed among you might notice that my egg whites are over beaten. Sometimes you can still get away with it, but overbeaten egg whites can collapse, causing a runny cream. This is still very viable filling, especially after it's had the chance to set up in the fridge, but I want to pipe our filling. So in order to stiffen things up, I'm beating one cup of heavy cream to a state of whipped creamedness and gently folding that into our mascarpone cream to give it some structure and rigidity. Once again, just folding the bare minimum number of times until combined. Now comes the time to excise the lady fingers from their baking vessel. If you did them in one large sheet like this, I like to just invert onto another sheet pan or if you pipe them individually, you can just grab and stack as desired in your tiramisu. But after doing a little bit of maths, Kendall and I figured out that if we baked a ladyfinger the size of a half sheet like this one, if we cut it directly down the center, both 
layers should fit perfectly into a standard issue 13x9 casserole. All we gotta do is blow a little bit of fairy dust for good luck and grab our Babish casserole, which, okay, once measuring it doesn't fit exactly, but it's pretty close. Now, a popular option for assembling a tiramisu is in a springform pan, but avid viewers of the show might remember why I'm opting for a casserole. Yeah, so if you're using a spring form, make sure that stuff is secured. If you're using a casserole, we're gonna start by putting down a little bit of the mascarpone cream, kind of like you would sauce in a lasagna. Then we're placing down our first layer and of course, saturating it with coffee. Strong, freshly brewed, and allowed to cool to room temperature. At this stage, you can also optionally add a couple tablespoons of Marsala wine. Now we're gonna use a pastry brush to translate that coffee into our lady fingers. You want them just soaked enough that the brush is starting to damage them, but not so soaked that they're falling apart. Then we're topping the first layer with a little less than half of our mascarpone cream, spreading that out nice and even, topping with the second layer of ladyfingers, and repeating the coffee saturation process. Almost a cup total of coffee went into my layers of ladyfingers, and you could probably use more if you wanted. Now you can apply the top decorative layer of mascarpone cream pretty much however you want. In spite of my complete lack of decorating skills, I'm eschewing the usual rustic smear pattern popular amongst non-decorators, instead opting for all these little pipettes, we'll call them, which before refrigerating, I'm gonna generously dust with cocoa powder. Now the one problem with my piping pattern was a little shady area below each peak that the cocoa powder could not reach, creating cocoa bald spots. Luckily, if I just turn it around, you guys will never know the difference. Also, this is not the last time this guy's getting dusted with cocoa powder because he's getting covered and fridged for at least four hours. Bare minimum, if you're in a tiramisu emergency, ideally you want to go overnight. Let those flavors meld, let those lady fingers soak up all that good stuff, and while it looks like the cocoa powder got pretty gross, it's really just become the foundation for a second dusting, ensuring that now even the bald spots are safely ensconced under a layer of chocolate dust. And now, finally, we can serve. If you want nice, clean cuts, let's say you're making a cooking show, you might want to give your knife a quick bath in some hot water before each cut, and hopefully you'll be rewarded with distinct layers, soaked fingers, set cream, all coming together to form that unmistakable tiramisu look. But has it taste? And the answer is, well, fantastic. The cream is light, soft, and flavorful. The lady fingers are ethereal, they just melt in the mouth, and soaked through and through with freshly brewed coffee. I know that all the raw eggs might be freaky for some people, just make sure that you're getting fresh, high-quality eggs. You can even pasteurize them if you have a sous vide. Now, despite itself being made of coffee, all I want to drink with this is a really great cup of coffee. So thanks again to Mocha Master for sponsoring this episode. The coffee brewer that makes the best and easiest pour over coffee possible in the comfort of your own home. Mocha Master makes the best cup of coffee because of science. Brewing at the right temperature for the right amount of time, the right amount of agitation, and the total dissolved solids, aka the amount of coffee in your coffee. Not only do these brewers make incredible pour over style coffee, they are built to last. Repairable for life and backed by a five year warranty. There are multiple styles and models, but every Mocha Master Master uses the same technology to make the same great coffee. Check out the link in the video description for your chance to win one of these 10 brewers. A Mocha Master with my face on it.